spirit, such a sweet spirit. If you're not standing, guys, ask that you would stand as we pay reverence. I done told y'all sit down too quick. Y'all, y'all sit down too quick. Let's pay reverence unto God. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for the sweet anointing spirit that's in this place. Father, we just ask right now that you would bless the reading and the dividing and the interpretation of this word. Father, I pray right now, God, that you would hide me behind the cross of your son. Let him be exalted and glorified. And Father, I cannot do this without you. Would you please anoint me to carry the weight of this gospel one more time. Father, I give you all honor, all glory. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray, and everybody's going to shout at me. Amen. Amen. Come on, you you may now be seated. My Lord, Gospel of John. Gospel of John, are you excited? Last week, we didn't make it too far. I was on the phone with Tommy earlier, uh, mostly talking about fishing. And he said, are you going to finish three and all the way through four? I said, I doubt it. But we'll try. Let's recap. That way we know exactly kind of where we are in the gospel. Um, And then we'll take back off. Jesus has finished talking to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is a picture of Israel. He's a picture of what happens when we get stuck in religiosity. When we get stuck in traditionalism, we're so bound by the, the routine and the culture and we're so bound by the, the, the traditions and all those types of things that we fail to see the blessing that is supposed to be contained within them. So Nicodemus is not only a Pharisee, but he's a member of the Sanhedrin. He is supposed to be the, the cream of the crop, the top of all the rabbis but yet he still cannot understand because he is not looking through the eyes of the spirit do you know tonight that you'll never truly understand the word and what God has for you unless you learn to look through the eyes of the spirit and say Lord let me not see with my physical eyes but let me hear with my heart and my spirit what you would have to say so Nicodemus here has this conversation with Jesus and we know John 3 16 for God so loved the world that He gave his only son. And and we went through the Greek translation of what the only son was. And we looked at the word eternal life and how it does not mean everlasting. And I know that threw some of you off, but stay with me. So let's pick up here in the 22nd verse of the third chapter. Wave at me like Forrest Gump when you're there. Amen. Amen. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John was also baptizing at Eonon near Salim because the water was plentiful there. And people were coming and being baptized for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification and they came to John and said to him Rabbi he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness look he is baptizing and all are going to him John answered get your pen ready a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from Heaven. Now, in, in, in this moment, we've got to get past Western culture. And listen, this may go 40,000 miles above your head, but let me give it to you. Heaven is not a place that's marked out with a chain link fence. Okay, heaven's not a place where, where you're floating above the world on a cloud and pinching stars. So what is heaven? And and if we look biblically through the whole canon of Scripture, we understand that heaven is wherever God is. So let's look at, and, and heaven can be wherever. Wherever He is, wherever His presence is, that is heaven. 
So let's look at the scripture again. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from the presence, from the very control center, from the very place where God is. Heaven is wherever he is. How could heaven be so good if he was not there? So if he moves locations, if he shifts, then heaven has to shift with him. Because it wouldn't be sweet without him there and being in his presence. Oh, Lord. That's why Jesus, like I said, he looked at a cross, a thief on a cross, and he didn't say, hey, brother, today you'll be with me in heaven. He says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today you'll be with me in the garden. If we look at it, Jesus probably spoke in the Aramaic language. One of the three languages spoken and written in the Bible. So we would translate it in the Aramaic. Today, paradise, paradisia, you will be through the Aramaic. You will be with me in the gone. You will be with me in the garden. You will be with me wherever my Father's presence is, wherever He is. So the Bible is saying that we cannot receive anything unless it comes from that place. You yourself, listen, this is what John, John, I, I like John the Baptist because he reminds me of me. Because sometimes you can say, John, you just really don't know when to shut. Y'all know them type of people, the first thing that comes to the mind is the first thing across the lips. And John was not scared, he was not timid to release what was put into his mind. And I believe that's why he come in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way. How many knows that a coward, somebody that, that was timid, somebody that wanted was scared to speak, huh, would not be able to prepare the way. But listen to what he says. He says, hey, you can't receive anything unless it comes from the presence of God. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christos. I am not the Christ. But I have been sent. Now we got to get this concept. And Jesus even talks. And he even, Jesus even gives a that a boy to John the Baptist. He said, none greater have come before me. And that he has come in the spirit of Elijah. So we look through that old story of the prophets Elijah and Elisha and we understand that Elijah was the first and if we look through scripture Elijah he, he performed eight miracles eight miracles but then as he was down on his luck because even though y'all might think that a man of God never goes through things sometimes we still struggle too so Carly, as he was down on his luck, the Bible says that he come across Elisha and Elisha ministered to him. But then he prayed something a little bit later. He said, Lord, I pray thee, let a double portion of your anointing fall upon me. And we read the story of Elisha and he gets to 15. He gets to 15 miracles, Carly. And it's, it, you're, you're right there, Elisha. Just one more. And you will completely fulfill the double portion that you prayed for. How many knows that his promises, they're still yes and they're still amen. But it looks like, oh man, you were so close. You ever felt like that? I was so close. I could, I could almost taste it. I could almost feel it. I could almost imagine what it was like already. But then life happened. Oh, Lord. Elisha makes it to number 15 and he dies and it looks like all hope. Look at somebody and say, this thing ain't over until God says it so. See, there's a lot of people that have been looking at you laying in a state of death. And they have been looking at you laying in a state of stagnation. And they have counted you out. But what you got going for you that they ain't got going for them is you believe that it ain't over, God, until you say it's over. I know it don't look good. I know the situation ain't right. But God has still not spoken. And I'm standing that his promises...
There's still yes. There's st- my God. Everybody else probably said it's over for that old boy. He's dead and in the grave. But they brung a man by his sculpture where they had buried the man of God, the man of God that had made it to number 15 in miracles. And they threw a dead man in on, somebody look at somebody and say the anointing is tangible. The anointing is transferable because the Bible says when they threw him in on the, see Elijah and John the Baptist prepared the way, but Elisha's death brought life. And now we got to see that, that Jesus is saying, if he's Elijah and I'm Elisha, then my death is ultimately going to bring back life. Why? Because when they threw the bone, the body of the dead man on top of Elisha, the Bible says, and it's right and you're wrong, but the Bible says that he come to life. And then there was number When everybody else said he didn't make it. Oh, when, oh my Lord, I, I, you know, I'm going to get back to it. I'm not going to preach. I'm trying to teach. He says, I was sent before him. The one who has, uh, y'all, this is deep, y'all. This is Brother Tommy. I ain't making it through number four. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom. Let me break this down for you in our language. The one who has the bride is the groom. Okay? And the friend of the groom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Now see, this makes not a whole bunch of sins until we look at it in Jewish culture. Uh Uh-oh. Because this is Jewish culture, Carly. That after I proposed to you and after our fathers agreed that you were worth two cows and four pigs. Right? Because you had to pay a penance. You had to pay a, a, a dowment. And after that agreement was made, then I had a duty to go back and build a bridal chamber. I didn't get to take you right then. But I had to go back and and build a bridal chamber. And after my father said, your bridal chamber looks good enough, go retrieve what is yours. The whole time the bride's waiting on her knight in shining armor to show up. So this is what they're talking about. That when the groom would approach the house of the bride, he would begin to release a shout to let his bride know, I've come back for you, baby. And the Bible oh, Lord Jesus. Listen, it says, the friend of the bridegroom rejoices greatly when he hears when he hears the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. It is now fulfilled. And and what is joy? Joy is not an emotion. I know some of y'all have heard me preach this, but joy is the manifested reality of relationship did did y'all grab that I I heard a silence fall joy is not an emotion maybe if you think and you want to spin it that it's an emotion in your life that's fine but as we read through the biblical text joy is really the manifested reality of relationship that's why it makes better sense when the Bible says with joy Jesus looked to the cross why? he didn't look to it because of all the pain but because of the relationship he was fixing to build with you let's look at it again therefore this manifested reality of being in relationship with the groom. 
is now complete. He is here. He must increase. And I must decrease. He must be put front and center. And I must get out of the way. See, that's a problem, Brooklyn. That's a problem that we have. We, we, we got to learn to step out of the way. 31, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. 32, grab this. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard. He bears witness to what he has. What is that? That's past tense. So there, right there in the Gospel of John, he already places him in a place before his present. Does that make sense? That's, that these things will build up to how he was able to tell the Pharisees before Abraham was. I am. Right? He says he only testifies of things that he has seen and he has heard. My Lord. Yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this that God is true. Here we go. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God. For he gives the Spirit with go with me just quickly to Deuteronomy in the 18th chapter. Deuteronomy 18. I'm going to start probably in the 17th verse. Deuteronomy 18. How many knows that we cannot understand the Bible, the New Testament, without the Old Testament in context? Deuteronomy 18, are you there? Now you keep your finger there. Let me go back to John and read this to you again. John 3 and 34 says, For he whom God has sent utters the words of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. Deuteronomy 18 and the 17th verse. God's talking to Moses and then Moses is beginning to tell the people that there is coming a Mashiach. There's coming a Messiah and he's going to deliver you and he's going to lead you out of the, the, out of the Egypt that you're going to be in. Maybe not in the physical place, but you're going to be in a place of bondage and slavery. And he's going to talk and look and do things a lot like I do. But here's how you're going to know that he is the one. Verse 17, and the Lord said to me, and Yahweh said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command. He says, I only do and say what I hear and see the Father doing. You've got to understand when Jesus speaks, it's not his, it's not the words that he's conjuring up in his own mind, but it is the, the, the words and the voice of God that he is bringing, bringing out. He says, he shall speak to them all that I command and whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name. I myself will require it of him. Back to John. Are you back in John? John, the and, and I was going to wait to the end of this, and I'm going to prove it to you. John, the son of Zebedee, did not write the Gospel of John. He did not write the book of Revelation. He did not write... 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. We'll prove it. Okay? Everybody's thinking, man, he don't know what he's talking about. I'll prove it to you. John the Elder. And what's um, important to know is that John the Elder, as we look through Jewish records, John the Elder, Elder was a high priest. 
of the temple, which means he was a Sadducee at one time, which means he, he was very in tune with Jewish law and Jewish mysticism. And what he is doing here is he is trying to paint the picture for the Jews that this is the one. This is the Deuteronomy 18 prophet. Why do you think so many things look like Moses? As we go through it, I'll point them out to you. That they went through us to the other side of the sea and a great multitude followed him. And then Jesus went up on the mountain just like Moses went up on the mountain. It will be shown to you that he's saying, hey, look guys, and we've lost these things. Carly, through time, especially in our Western culture, we've lost reality with the, with the truth that's contained here. But he's pointing a picture, hey, y'all better look at this guy again because he's a lot like Moses said be looking for. Let's move on. 35, and the father loves the son and has given some things into his hand. Come on now. And the father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life can be present. Okay? Remember we talked last week how eternal and everlasting are, are, are separate. They're two totally different things. Eternal talks about a depth. It talks about a richness. It talks about a quality, a peace of mind, that type of life. Everlasting life is life that goes on and on and on forever. Everlasting life is good, but eternal life is better. Why? Because it is a quality. He doesn't say in the Word, Carly, that you've got to wait till you die. For God so loved the world that whosoever shall what shall not but have that everlasting versus eternal eternal you can have now eternal you can possess now a richness a quality of life that he has set for you he does not want you living in depression he does not want you living in a state where you can't even get out of the bed. That's not what he's called you to. That's not eternal life. Would make no sense. Well, I'm, I'm going to leave it alone right there. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. It doesn't say will have. Y'all get this, right? Has is present tense right now. I can obtain it now. I ain't got to wait till I'm sitting ten toes up. I about said six toes. I got ten toes. I promise you I do. Right? I don't know. By God, I won't count no more words. This side of the audience over here. <laughs> Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. My Lord. Now, for now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he came to pass through Samaria. This is very important that you underline, and he had to pass through Samaria. Let's look at it from a few different standpoints. Is that okay? He didn't have to go physically. He was saying, my journey in the spirit, the Father, where I've got to go, i got to pass through Samaria. But what's even more important is for you to grab Samaria. And as we look at it through the Bible and the history of the Bible, it changes names a lot. Sychar, Shechem. But it's a very important place. Get ready to write. Genesis 12. The promise was given to Abraham in Shechem, in Samaria, that I'm going to give your children. This is their inheritance. Jacob and Esau, when they were reconciled together, it was at Shechem or Samaria or Sychar. And when Joshua said, we're fixing to get back to what God has called us to do, and he reinstituted the Passover, and after he did that, then God allowed him to cross over the Jordan. Guess where it was? 
Think about it, Barbie. The promise is given to the, to the father of nations, Abraham, in Shechem. And he said, Abraham, here, all that you see, I'm going to give it. This is your inheritance. Back in the same place, listen, two brothers were reconciled together. Then a few books later, the children of Israel in the presence of God were reconciled back together in the same place. And now here we are back in the same place and God's fixing to say, look, here's my son. He's come to reconcile some things back to himself. They asked him, they said, what, what are you doing? He says, I've come to call all the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I, I've not, he says, I'm willing that none should perish. Look at somebody and say, none should perish. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter the history that we're fixing to get through, uh, to here in the book. But he's saying, I've come to gather the whole house of Israel. And it's funny that he does it at the same place that two brothers were reconciled, that the people in his presence were reconciled. Now Jesus is here and he's saying, I'm fixing to do it and no man will be able to undo it. I'm fixing to do it permanently. How? Because I'm going to offer myself as a sacrifice for burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. You have had no pleasure. But lo, I come in the volume of the book. It's written to me, O oh God, to do your will for thou hast prepared me a body my God I feel the preacher man rising up in here yes sir no I gotta get up and go fishing at 4 o'clock in the morning I don't amen this Samaria is important it's impervious I didn't know I knew words like that. I don't know what it means. Lord Jesus. He didn't have to go through Samaria, but the will of the Father says, Oh Lord, I didn't come just for Judah. I didn't just come for the southern kingdom, but I've come to reconcile it all unto me. As we move through this thing, we'll see as Jesus is moving and doing, he is on a mission. And his number one mission is to destroy the works of the enemy. It's cosmic geography, how he is reclaiming the territory. Everywhere he, oh, Lord only. And he meets this chick. Now see, Miss Sandy. The book of Kings is an interesting book. But we'll find out if we really look into it that there might have been two or three good kings in the southern kingdom of Judah. Maybe. Hezekiah. There, there was two or three decent kings. The northern kingdom had no good kings. And the southern kingdom in large majority had terrible kings also. But after Solomon dies, his son, Rehoboam, decides I'm going to split the kingdoms. So Israel, have you ever read through the Bible and been really confused? Like, okay, Israel, now we're talking about Judah. I thought it was all the same place. No, it split. Okay? So the northern kingdom is referred to in the latter half of the Old Testament as Israel. The southern kingdom is referred to as Judah. Judah and Benjamin was the only one, only two that stayed there. And, and, and we'll get into that maybe later in the book. But what happened was when they split, and I'm tired of hearing people say there was no mercy in the Old Testament. How do you get that? How was that even a concept? Maybe you haven't read the Old Testament because he tries over... It, he started with Adam and that didn't work out too good. So he moved to a man named Noah. That didn't, that didn't work either. He got drunk and got naked, right? Y'all know the story. And then we moved on and, and we went to Abraham and, and Isaac and Jacob and he's trying over and over and over again. And, to, and he finally says, I got more, I'm going to have to do it myself. Oh, 
all, Lord Jesus. That's why when Abraham woke up, he seen that the smoking fire pot was moving between the sacrifice by itself because he knew, Abraham, you're not going to be able to do it, son, but I'm going to be in covenant with myself to make sure because I've made you a promise and he who promised is still... F We're not making it through four. But Sandy, when the kingdom split, God tries over and over and over again. And the Bible says, and Ahab did worse than his father. And then Ahab's son walked in the ways of his father. And he erected golden images and Asherah poles and all these things. So finally, God says, you know what? Have it your way. Woo! Uh oh. He said, okay, if you want to play like that. My daddy used to tell me, Sandy, he said, son, if you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. But anyway, God says, I'm going to turn you over but don't worry, I'm still God. Uh-oh. But anyway, this, this country called Assyria at that time, Assyria, was most brutal. To this day, one of the most brutal. Carly, they would take pregnant women and, and, and cut them and remove the baby because how many knows oh, at the moment of conception in life, it's not a fetus, it's a life. Don't get me started. But when they, rem they would remove the baby while the mother was still alive, execute the baby in front of the mother, and then just leave the mother to die. How, I mean, they were a ruthless people. But what Assyria would do that was even more ruthless than that was they would take country's identity. And what they would do is they would infiltrate it with other countries that they had um, taken over and that they had... Um, invaded so let's just look quickly 2 Kings 17 2 Kings 17 this is talking about the invasion of the northern kingdom of Israel 2 Kings 17 and 24 Assyria has invaded and the king are y'all ready? And the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, which is modern day Iraq, Kuth Avah, Hamath and Lord Jesus Sephoth Ravim Whew, I practiced that one Don't ask me to do it again Count those One, two, three Four Five, baby, I know you went to Bessemer City, but it stops there. Five. Can y'all say that with me? They took five different countries and placed them where? In the cities of Samaria instead of the people of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and they live in their cities. Back to John, let's make this make sense. That's why the Jews, you know, they weren't called Jews until they left exile, right? But this is why the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along and the Jews referred to them as dogs. Why? Because Assyria had implanted people from five different countries to dilute the identity in the bloodline of who they were. Do you know that the enemy is still polluting and diluting the bloodline of a chosen people? How are they doing it? They're doing it through your children. Oh, let's make this make sense. For and as he passed, and as he had to pass through Samaria, he came through a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied, he is showing humanity. He is fully divine, yet at the same time, he is fully human. Mm, mm. 
He got tired. He got thirsty. He got hungry. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to be able. That's why he said we have not. Paul said we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. Why? Because he has walked the same. Mm. Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. This was noon, 12 o'clock. The sixth hour is noon. Y'all know the sun is right above your head. How many work outside? Wave your hand at me. My Lord, I need to apply. Tommy, you work in a pickup truck. Outside with AC, yeah. But y'all know today at 12 o'clock, when it was about 90 degrees and humid, it was hot. Same thing for Jesus. He was thirsty, so he sat down, but that wasn't the real listen. He sat beside the well, and it was about noon, and a woman. Y'all need to underline that. What here is beautiful, Elizabeth? She's got no name. A woman. Amen. We're going to believe that little man accidentally hit the light switch, but you're good. It says a woman. This is showing here that she had no name. And if you have no name, you have no identity. Because it had been stripped. She is a woman. She is there physically, but metaphorically. She is the picture of the northern kingdom of Israel that has been looked at as nothing. Because y'all know women in these days was the lowest in the, in, on the totem pole. So a woman with no name, no identity, come from Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, way out of line, Jews don't speak to Samaritans, number one. And number two, she is a woman. Mm -mm. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. I love it. I love it because I preached last week, last Sunday, about getting alone in a cave, right? There's something special happens when it's just me and him. Because the same conversation couldn't have taken place in front of the disciples. Why? Because he was about to enter into an intimate moment with this woman by the well. And if all his homeboys would have been with him, the moment wouldn't have meant so much. News flashed to everyone in the room. God cannot have an intimate moment with you when everybody else's voice is in your ear. Look at somebody and say, I got to get to the well. Oh, Lord. The disciples are gone. He says, hey, hey, woman, give me a drink. Nine. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. We know why now, right? Because they were polluted. They're diluted. Their bloodline is not pure. You're dogs, right? Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it was that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you. Now, I'm going to end right here, but I want you to get this. If you knew the gift of Yahweh, the gift of God, and who it was, who is it? One usia, three hypostases. One, one, one control, one, one main thing, but presented and manifested in three different ways. And, and I know sometimes we have a hard time divesting what the Trinity is, and we don't really understand it, but He is God in the flesh. In the beginning, there was the Word, and the Word was... And then the Word became... He says, if you knew the gift that's sitting in front of you, you would have asked me to give you a drink. Listen, it says, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Throughout scripture, we see that the spirit is always connected to water. 
Water is always connected. In the beginning, the, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. It was hovering over the face of the deep. The Spirit is always connected. So if we look at it again, if, if you would know who was with you, you would have asked Him and He would have given you the living... Stay with me here. And the woman said, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than, catch it, our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself and so did his sons and his livestock and Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again but whoever drinks of the spirit that I will give him they will never be thirsty again. The, the, the water, remember water spirits always connected. The ruach, the, the panuma, the very vitality of who he is. He's saying if you drink of this water here you'll be thirsty again. But if you'll let me fill you with the water, with the spirit, with the ruach that I have, you will never want again. That's why David said, God you are my portion. Stand with me. The water that I will give him or her or you will become in him a spring of water welling up to what? Eternal life. Not when you die. Right now. Why wait? Why should we be satisfied with waiting until we're ten toes up, not six, in a wooden box and somebody that barely knows us speaking over us when we can... God says you can have it now, but there's a recipe. You've got a drink of a water. There's an old song that says, just give me a drink, God, of the water. He says, I'll give him a water and the water will well up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir... Give me this water so that I will not be thirsty nor have to come here to draw water. Somebody says, went right over her head. The book of Ezekiel talks. Don't quote me now. Ezekiel 47. We'll get here in a minute or tomorrow and Thursday. No, not next Thursday. I remembered. Don't be here next Thursday. There's nobody else to be here. But Ezekiel says, And the Lord showed me and he carried me to a temple that was facing east. And out of the threshold of the temple flowed a water. Well, we get the same imagery in the book of Revelation of a water that is flowing. And and if we look hard enough, we'll see that that water, that, that life source that he's talking about is not really water, but it is the Spirit of God that is flowing. And the Bible says wherever it flows, whatever it touches, whatever it comes in contact with, it grows, it flourishes, it changes. And I don't know about you, but I still believe that if you'll just get in contact with the spirit if you'll drink of the water huh? it still makes all things new so if you're standing with me here's my cry here's my pray my prayer tonight is you get to the well Jesse do you know that song I put these boys on the spot, I know, and ladies, huh? He said, he'll make it work. That's what I like. I tell my leadership team all the time, don't bring me a problem, bring me a, bring me a solution. Can you imagine what this woman, because she really did have five husbands. But God orchestrates things. I don't believe in coincidence anymore. I think things line up and they happen for strategic reasons but can you imagine 
She's drawing water at 12 o'clock because she's only not only been shunned by the Jews, but she's, all, she's also been shunned by her own people. Probably because she'd been married five times would be my guess. So she's drawing water at the hottest part of the day because nobody else wants to be with her. Nobody else thinks she's worthy enough to hang out with. Nobody wants to be seen with her. Nobody wants to be associated with her. But yet the Lamb of God comes and sits down with her. And not only does he sit, but he says, I want to give you something. And this thing that I want to give you is more than anything you can receive from anybody else. And matter of fact, the thing that I'm going to give you is going to lead you to eternal life, a richness. I know you've been living in the slums. I know you're depressed. I know everybody looks at you like you're some type of floozy. But I can give you something that takes you from glory to glory. Here's the thing, though. Brooke, yeah, I'm talking to you, girl. Is there still room at the well? In, 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 in my Bible, I know that he is omnipresent, which means he is everywhere at all times, which means he was, he was there when I was born, but at that very moment, he was already there when I die, which means he's already at the well and he is waiting on me to come and draw My Lord, my, my cry to you is get to the well. Don't get to me. I can't listen. I can pray for you. I can pray with you. But it's really going to happen when you get to the well and you say, God, I'm going to drink of myself, Lord. I don't want the pastor to force feed me. I want to do it myself. So my cry as we begin to close with every head bowed and every eye closed, how many is ready to drink of that water? How many is ready to say, God, it's been so long. I'm still thirsty, Lord, and I want to continue to drink and partake. If that's you, would you come tonight? Would you come say, Lord, I want to be like the woman of Samaria, Lord. I know I'm not worthy. God, I know I've done some terrible things in my life. I'm not proud of them, God. I'm ashamed of them. But, Lord, if you're still offering that water, Lord, just give me a drink. Would you come? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Saints, would you be praying with me? Come on, Jesse, sing just a little bit.
Lord. I'm waiting on somebody to come take this microphone. No? Okay, I'm going to do it. Guys, it's so great to have you here tonight. Um, as we go through the Gospel of John, it's a great privilege to preach the Word to you in this Gospel. I want to remind you that next Thursday we will be having